right, so our apostle for this morning is Matthew. Yay! <laughs> um, so let's go with the first photo we got here. Johnny, let's, let's start working through it. Now, um, that's probably not what Matthew, a Jewish man from Capernaum, looked like. Just to kind of let you all know that. That looks more like uh, somebody from Southern Europe writing in a book, all right? <laughs> but this is the thing about art. Art is trying, it tries to capture, you know, something soaring often, you know, like some of the best art that we remember is that kind of stuff that's transcendent. Somehow it's anchored to like a historical event, but, but the, the artist adds into it components that are meant to, to move us somehow. So notice the person behind him. That's the angel helping him write the gospel. Let's go to the next one. Um, so here, and we're gonna, I've got this one up for tradition. I'm going to kind of weave the tradition and scripture parts together a little bit on him. just um, Because with Matthew, what, what gets difficult is this whole scope of him, like as an apostle, as a man, because he has an entire gospel attributed to him. All right? So that's why there's going to be a little bit more overlap than what I've been doing with, with the apostles so far. But I've got this world map here for you to see. So you see where um, Ethiopia is down there, uh, south of Yemen. So according to the tradition of the church, that's where he ends up being martyred. Um, and there's a town associated with it, but we can't, I don't know where it is. I did a lot of research to figure out where is that town. Nothing came up as to where it is now. And in all likelihood, it's not that Ethiopia. It's Abyssia, which is something probably closer to Sudan. Ethiopia was a, it was a much, the nations were shaped differently 2,000 years ago. Right? But this is a, a map to kind of give you an idea. While you have the, you know, Thomas goes to India, uh, you know, Andrew goes up into uh, the Ukraine uh, area, you know, and you get, uh, Paul gets out to Spain. I know we haven't talked about him yet, but you know, they kind of get all over the place. It's thought that Matthew goes down into that portion of Africa. The church is there. Um, that's kind of the tough part. You know, when the year is 313 and it's legal to be a Christian, and you've got Christians everywhere, people are trying to figure out, now how did we get here? So there's a very old tradition that while Matthew was celebrating the Eucharist, he was slain by a local king, by, by a king's command, because one of the king's relatives had converted um, a matter of fact, I think it was a, a woman that the king had planned to marry converted, and the king was furious that she decided to become a Christian, so she had Matthew, he had Matthew killed while he was celebrating at the Lord's table. Let's go to the next one. This, these are remains uh, of churches in that part of Africa that go back long, long, long ago on a continent Far, far away. That was supposed to be a joke. Okay, let's go to the next one. This is in Italy. That is the, the, the crypt, the shrine, uh, where his remains are. Do we have another one of those? I don't think we do. I think I just got the one I put up there. No, just this one. So we'll leave that one up for a little bit before we go to the next one. Um, just so to kind of give you a, a catch up a little bit with Matthew and where he went and what he did. Um, we'll say that. Now, um, for tradition, let me, let me, if you've got a Bible, you've got a tangible Bible in your hand, just go ahead and grab it for a second. If you don't, just pretend. Okay? Now, your Bible, most people in here, I'm going to guess your Bible is in English. Yep. Am I right on that? Yes. Okay, all right. Now, I realize we may have some folks that read the Bible in Spanish, you know, just uh, that, that are part of the congregation. We have some that may read it in Ukrainian, you know, so, so. Yeah, that's all right. Well, you know, the Bible was written in the Old Testament, mostly in Hebrew, the New Testament, pretty much all in Greek. You got some smattering in the Old Testament that's in Aramaic, right? So one of the first translations of the Bible comprehensively was Latin by Jerome in the latter part of the 300s. Well, there is a pretty well-established tradition that when Matthew first wrote his gospel, he wrote it in Hebrew, he took notes while Jesus was preaching. 
And so his gospel was written in Hebrew and then later on was eventually translated into Greek. When Jerome, hundreds of years later, is in the process of translating the Hebrew and the Greek into Latin, he's given a Hebrew copy of Matthew's gospel that had been copied from the, the original kept in Capernaum. Caesarea, kept in Caesarea. So there's a long-standing tradition that Matthew's gospel had been written in Hebrew. Now, um, there's some evidence for this in the Greek text itself of Matthew. Because the way the, the syntax works, the grammar in certain terms, aren't things you would say in Greek. You would say them in Hebrew. And so it really looks like that's what happened. Now, we can get into, Larry, lots of you know, historical ramblings on that, but whether it's true or not is pretty neat. So this is, an, and I do think he probably wrote in Hebrew. I think there's long-standing church tradition that he did. But just to kind of give you an idea, because unlike some of the other apostles, whom it looks like fairly early, like, or, or they didn't stay in Jerusalem a long time. After Pentecost, they're there for a little bit, then they go out, and they come back, and they go out, and they come back. It looks like Matthew spends at least a decade or so, some historians think, doing ministry amongst the Jews. And that's when he compiles his gospel before he goes south into Africa. So, let's talk then, and I think that's, that's, that's a pretty fair assessment of the tradition on him. Um, so let's talk about what the scripture plainly tells us. Well, scripture says he was a publican. He was a tax collector. Now, Paul's, okay? And let's just think about this for a second. The last guy, last week, was Simon the Zealot. Right. Mm -hmm. Zealots carried small swords and stabbed Roman soldiers to, so they could hide their swords and go back into crowds. And here's a guy collecting money for them. Jesus didn't go and pick people who naturally would have sat down together in the lunchroom and had a good laugh. He picked people who would have killed each other if they could have met each other in the right circumstances to be his disciples, and he makes them get along. Why do we do ministry the way that we do it? Sorry, Johnny, I'm getting into application. Let me come back. He's a tax collector. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the process, tax collectors were typically part of something called tax farming, meaning the Romans didn't collect taxes themselves. They had a third party do it. Now, for those of you that are caught up to speed with the federal treasury, you know that federal treasury doesn't mean it's part of the federal government. <coughs> it's not. It's an entirely different institution. Well, that's not new. Because the Romans had a third party, and that third party organization hired the collectors. And Rome didn't care how much the tax farming, how much the tax collectors collected, as long as they got their taxes. So every time, every, you know, certain times throughout the year, the, 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 the tax farming organization, so to speak, we'll just use some modern language for it, would take the money that had been collected for taxes and pay it to Rome. <coughs> but if you're the tax collector, you're, you're pretty plush. You've probably got an office, probably got a desk. You probably are pretty fluent in Aramaic, Greek, a smattering of Latin. You're good with numbers and figures, and you've got some power. You're a social outcast. People don't like you. But you are a person of means. And who's going to get in your way if you do want to complain? All you have to do is tell the Roman soldiers that have been stationed to guard you while you're taking money, not just taking money, gouging people so that you can live well. You, and, and here's the thing. Matthew is from Capernaum. He's from the same town Simon and Andrew are from and James and John are from. Now, you can be guaranteed that Matthew collected tax money from Simon and his brother and the sons of Zebedee. Hmm. Jesus didn't go get strangers who didn't get along. He went and got people in the same town who didn't get along. But we will break ties with people in the body of Christ because of ugly color carpet. Becky and I were doing ministry at a church down in, in, in a certain state that I won't name. And the, the carpet was, no, please excuse my, my strong language here. It really was vomit green. I mean, <laughs> it, was, it was legitimate like someone had, it was just, it was, and I'm thinking, why would you put it in the church? Oh, well, they must like it. Like, I'm like, it's not my call. I don't really care in that sense. And thank God for a church. Well, then I find out. 200 yards up the street, walk out the front door, 
200 yards up and across the street, let's put the proper distance here, is the church that was a split from that church. And they split over the carpet. That's not a gospel issue. Right? But that's what they did. And they were in the same denomination. Isn't like an overseer supposed to say, get along? Jesus goes and gets guys who would, they're not going to spend time together. And he says to all of them equally, the same thing, follow me. Follow me. That's what Matthew is. Remember the account of Zacchaeus, when the Lord goes and has dinner with Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus does what? He jumps up from dinner and he says, I'm going to pay back fourfold. That's the law of Moses, that you pay back fourfold from what you had stolen. Zacchaeus has the money to do that. In all likelihood, so does Matthew. Now, the Bible calls, uh, recounts his name as Levi. So it's a matter of tradition that says Matthew and Levi are the same guy. There's no direct scripture reference that says it, but it's so long-standing established that it's kind of moot to argue it. Right? As another one. You know, Tanny, I've met folks who say they don't need church tradition. They just need the Bible. Well, then I would ask to those people, stop using Matthew's name for that gospel. Stop using Mark's name for that gospel. Stop using Luke's name. Stop using John's name. Because they don't, nothing in the gospels or the New Testament says they wrote those gospels. That's all from the tradition of the church. And there it is blazoned upon every page of scripture when you're opening up the gospels. According to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. And that's tradition. Well, here he is, this publican, this tax collector, gouging Simon Peter, and we already know that Peter, Peter and, and his brothers, uh, you know, they're not the most gentle of figures. So you can kind of imagine when Matthew's there collecting money, and Peter walks up and he says, here's what I've got, that there's a, there's a, there's an exchange of more than just coins. <laughs> this is who this guy is. We don't know anything about his personality, but because his name is Levi, is it possible, and this is a little bit of speculation upon the text of Scripture, is it possible that he's Levite? He's from the Levitical tribe. That, and that accounts for some of his um, intellectual gift, you know, to be working with finances the way that he is. And if he is a Levite, he should be amongst the Levites at the temple. But ancient Judaism, and the, the Second Temple Judaism at this point in history, is very sectarian. A lot of ways like the church is today. So, is it possible that he's just named after Levi? Uh, which is at least the case. Is there more to it than that? We don't know, but it does give us something to think about when we're reading the text with him. And what's described by him. Because the, the name Levi means joined, like joined together. Matthew's gift of God. But Levi is joined together, meaning the Levites are joined to the Lord because they've been joined to Aaron and to the worship and, and the development, the practice, the maintenance, the sustaining of the tabernacle itself. They're joined together this way. Remember, the Levites don't have any property because the Lord is their portion. Even though they are given entire cities, it's not the same thing as the other tribes. Okay? Matthew's father's name is Alphaeus, and his mother is named Mary. She is thought to be one of Mary Theotokos, Mary, the mother of Christ, one of her cousins. That's not bizarre. So many people have the same names in the Bible that this is one of the reasons it gets difficult to figure out who's who. Now, here's another thing. Remember how James and John uh, follow John the Baptist. They're part of one, they're John's disciples. Well, remember in uh, Luke's gospel, Luke recounts that they come to, to John the Baptist and they start asking him about taxes. And John the Baptist says, don't take any more than you're supposed to, because that was the common custom. Is it possible that Matthew would have been aware of that? That he would have known about the preaching of John the Baptist? Like, th these are speculative questions from the text that give us pause to really learn and to pray and to hear what the Holy Spirit might be saying to us. What did Matthew know about the preaching of Jesus? In his gospel, has he already heard what he recounts for us from the Sermon on the Mount? You can't serve God and mammon. But here he is, serving Rome, collecting money, not really creating friends, not religious friends. 
It is of note that Matthew becomes such a prominent, his gospel so prominent, that in the Babylonian Talmud, which is a Jewish writing, uh, the Babylonian Talmud lists five disciples for Jesus. Uh, four of them, we don't know who they are, but that mentions Matthew. Uh, of course, this is in the same passage where they're calling Jesus a sorcerer. Um, but in the records that have come from that era, here is the description. Matthew is known to be among them. In his gospel, whatever, and we're going to touch on like the bridge when he goes from the tax collector to following Jesus, all right? But that, that bridge time when you're in history and he's, he's, he's being known outside of Christian circles. He's, he has that kind of influence. Um, I don't have a picture of this, but have you ever seen like the, the podium, the lectern that the gospel's read out of, and there's like a carved eagle on it? Have you all seen those? Carved eagle. That goes back to something that Irenaeus wrote in the late 100s, how the four gospels are the four cherubim in the Revelation, which are from Ezekiel. And so you've got the one with the face of a man, you've got the one with the face of an eagle, you've got the one with the face of an ox, and you've got the... Right. Now, Matthew, but John is the eagle. John's gospel is associated with the eagle because there's the Son of God soaring, right? He's all those I am statements. And so that's why the, the podium of the gospels are typically read from, traditionally, have had some kind of eagle symbol on them. Matthew is the winged man. Matthew would become the, the gospel that's associated with the, that particular cherub, cherubim is the one, the, the man with wings. So if you ever see a symbol, like you guys saw the, the seashell, the, sea, the, the, seashell. the seashells, <laughs> and it's like, I know about that. If you ever see like Christian art and there's a, a man, like a cherub, cherubs aren't naked babies, okay? Uh, with little wings that fly around your bathrooms. That's not cherubim, all right? These are wholly terrifying creatures if they were to, to, to be present, okay? Matthew is the cherub with the, man, the face of a man and wings. So if you see a picture like that, somebody is, is trying to bring up something about Matthew's gospel. When you put this together, and you think about who he was, and you think about the effect, let's look now at what the Lord did when he called him and pull some points of application. All right? Let's try this. And this may, I mean, I don't want to put anybody to sleep, but I'm going to do my best. Okay. First point of application, and unlike the others where I've kept it uh, you know, to just a few, I've got, I've got multiple here. So if you're taking notes, here's the first one. First point of application is Mark 2.17. In Mark 2.17, Jesus is at a party. And when he's being ridiculed by the Pharisees, he says, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus publicly calls Matthew, Levi, from the tax booth. He calls the fishermen, the four fishermen, while they're fishing, fishing or mending their nets, throwing nets or mending their nets. He calls Matthew from the tax booth in the process of probably overcharging to pad his pockets, he gets called. I want you to think about this. Because when we, when we go to present the gospel to people, I mean, especially if it's in a church service way, I mean, the organ's got to be playing good. There's a spirit. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. I'm not knocking that. But what's happened is that's how people get called to Jesus. Jesus calls people while they're fishing. He calls them while they're mending their nets. He calls them while they're ripping other people off. We need to put some teeth back in our gospel and stop apologizing for the summons to discipleship because the summons to discipleship is the entrance into the death and resurrection of Christ and there is no participation in divine resurrection and power if all we do is pedal something so soft nobody ever really repents. Wow. I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call the sinners to repentance and he did it publicly. Follow me, Jesus says. And the call is a call to devotion. Leave that life of mammon, Matthew, and become one of my disciples. Set aside what you have been pursuing and follow me into life. 
So here's my question then from this first point of application. Because Matthew, as we've said, Matthew is not a, he's not, he's not a laborer. He probably doesn't have large, gnarly, calloused hands like the fishermen. They're probably very soft. If anything, the calluses on the tips of the fingers from counting coins and writing on parchment. That's him. Jesus calls him out of that to follow him into something that's unknown. The Lord doesn't tell them what they're going to do right away. And even when he tells the fishermen that they're going to become fishers of men, he doesn't tell the tax collector, hey, you're going to come collect more coins. He doesn't say, hey, come follow me and I'm going to give you houses you didn't build and wells you didn't dig and vineyards you didn't plant. He doesn't tell him that. But we preach that. Come to Jesus and your problems are going to go away. Come to Jesus and you're going to get what you want. Come to Jesus and you have power to make whatever you want through your words of faith. Follow me. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. In this life you will receive persecutions. That's what the Lord calls these men into while they're about their daily work. So here's my question to you, to us this morning. Have you heard the Lord call you? Have you heard the Lord call you? Or is your participation in church something to extend your social life and your connections? Hmm. Have you heard the Master say, follow me? And you'll know He says, follow me, because He calls you into something that causes you to be unstable so that you have to live in faith. Hmm. I'm not saying He doesn't provide. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about you are no longer able to rely upon your own strength and your own wisdom and your own power. You have to begin to walk and follow Him. Wow. And the cost that is associated with that. Our second point of application this morning. Follow me. It's a call to a life of whole obedience. To seek the kingdom and its righteousness, God's righteousness. It's a life of surrender to Christ. So if you've heard the Master call you, here's the next question. Have you obeyed? This is the legacy Matthew's creating for us. By telling us how he was called and what he was called away from. Have you obeyed? Think about how the Lord does this with the, at least with a group of apostles at this point. You've got these guys following John the Baptist who ate bugs and didn't bathe. Well, he, you know, ritual cleansing, but he didn't like this whole Nazarite thing for John the Baptist. Bugs and honey. I mean, it's not the most, right? So you've got the guys following this firebrand who yells at rocks until crowds show up. Gets beheaded. Because he, he's, he's, uh, he's just rather direct. He's, he's truthful to his own hurt. Okay. You've got the guys following him. And then you've got Matthew, who's in real good with Rome. And Jesus calls them together. And he's trying to make, and he, he doesn't try. He makes them get along with each other because they're fighting all the time about who's going to be the greatest. And here's that call of follow me, to total surrender, to set that thing aside so that the guys who are, who are steeped in this prophetic holiness tradition are now called to go do things they don't want to do, like eat with sinners, like participate in parties. There are five parties Jesus attends in the Gospels. There's five of them. The first one is at Simon the Leper's, uh, they're not in order. But Simon the leper's house, Mark 14, Jesus is at a party with Simon the leper. Can't touch him. Jesus goes has dinner with him. He's not worried about their taboo issues. There's the dinner with the sinful woman, the party with the sinful woman. That's all we know. It's in Luke 7. Then we have the account of the dinner with unwashed hands in Luke 11. Then we have the account of uh, where he gives a lesson about the seat of honor, the, the, the party he's at there in Luke 14. And we have this one, the party at Matthew's house party at Matthew's house. Now the party at Matthew's house, I'm going to I'm going to uh, scripturally speculate here for a second Larry. You with me? This guy's loaded. 
This isn't sardine and cracker kind of party. This is a party. This is such a party. It's such a happening party. It's such a big, expansive, everybody's in town at this party that the only people who won't come are the Torah observant, religiously, religious Jews who stay outside. Because they're the ones who stay outside. He eats with sinners. He eats with the prostitutes. He eats with the drunkards. He eats with these tax collectors. You can hear it dripping out of Simon Peter's mouth. You can hear James and John wanting to summon thunder and lightning to destroy these evil people. And Jesus is in there enjoying himself. Because you can't call the sinners to repent if you're not among them. Follow me is a call into something outside of their comfort zone. In Matthew's case, it's going to be from that life of service to Rome and debauchery into a life dedicated to God and to Christ. As much as it is a call to the people who have been following John the Baptist to go into avenues and venues and highways and hedges to be around people that they normally wouldn't even get so close enough to have a conversation. Follow me. Here's the question. Here's the question. Have you followed him? Are you following him? What is prohibiting you from following him? And that's not really a, a good question. Because the question should be, what justification are you using to not follow the Lord into the places he's calling you into? Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? And how many Christian people gather and they sing worship songs of adoration and love to Jesus, but then do exactly what he forbids when they're done singing the song? Matthew is demonstrating for us that he gets up from his desk and the only thing that we could say that he takes with him is pen and and parchment because he knows God's called him into something different and he wants to keep a record of it. So, have you heard the call? Are you following Jesus? Thirdly, and this kind of touches on what I was mentioning about the party, but Matthew is an apostle of hospitality. He's an apostle of hospitality. I mean, you know, I love the buffet. Haven't been to one in months. <laughs> It's really difficult. You know, we've all got our crosses to bear. Right? <laughs> but here's this feast. I mean, can you imagine? Like, what? Have you ever seen, I tell you, there has been, there have been a couple Bible like movies that, that capture this scene pretty well. But one of the best, and they're, they're getting interpretive with it, but I think, that, I think the way the, the, the screenwriter or whoever put it together, the director, they did good. When Jesus of Nazareth, the TV series, came out in the late 1970s, when they get to this passage in the Gospels, it's at Matthew's house, it's a huge party, and all the, the apostles that have been called thus far are outside. But they have Jesus tell the story, the parable of the prodigal son in that party. And Jesus being, you know, filled with the Spirit without measure, when he starts to share the power, the Gospel of the Kingdom, the power is present. And the actors do a good job of capturing this. So as he's telling about that prodigal son who goes out and wastes everything that he's told, the, the, the people are tearing up because just that scene itself captures accurately what happens when we become vessels through whom the Holy Spirit works to call people that we would never even sit down and have a conversation with. And God grabs a hold of them. And he does it through our hospitality. Our hospitality becomes the means by which the gospel is proclaimed. Think about that in these four gospels, these five different accounts with teaching from Jesus when he's at dinner. Now much of the gospel is presented around a table. So we can see this. So here's my, my, the question then. Matthew being a, an apostle of hospitality, I realize we live in a pandemic, okay? I get that. But here's the question. 
Are you inviting people that you don't like to your home to eat with you? Or are you inviting people that you don't like out to dinner somewhere else? Are you building bridges and connections with people with whom you do not naturally get along? And I'm not saying you've got to become lifelong friends with them. But I'm just using this as an example to see what Matthew does. And then he invites Jesus, hey, come to the party at my house. Because I suspect that most folks in church are the people hanging outside the doors. Condemning the people on the inside. Well, you know, if they only served God. If they only did what Jesus said. If they'd only vote this way, the country would be right. If they'd only pray at these, certs, these times, the country would be right. If they only used my translation of the Bible, the country would be right. Hmm. When did any of that ever become the means for the demonstration of the kingdom? And it doesn't. Matthew is an apostle of hospitality showing us this, that you, know, you don't become accused of gluttony and drunkardness if you live like John the Baptist. Now, obviously, John the Baptist is one of my favorites. I'm not anti John the Baptist at all. But I understand my temperament. I understand the Lord's gift to, a, to an extent. You know, you understand what I'm saying to you about that? When we can understand who we are, like our own natural dispositions to things, then we can more rightly discern when the Holy Spirit's calling us into something because it's usually difficult. It's usually uncomfortable. It's usually outside of our comfort zone. If it's within all of the things that makes you comfortable, it's probably not the Holy Spirit. I've shared this before, but I heard a famous uh, 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 preacher sh share a story about how he was driving through the north side of town one day. The, the evening was, was coming on, and he was getting ready to go home because he had already been swamped busy with stuff going on that day. And he had this idea. I need to go down to the hospital. That was it. Like, there was nothing else to it. I need to go down to the hospital. And it kept happening. And so he was like, okay. Turns the wheel, drives to the half an hour down to the other side of the city, and he doesn't know what's going on. He just had this thought that wouldn't leave him alone. And, and he said, you know, I walked into the, into the ER, and this head pops up uh, on the other side of the trash can. It was the janitor. And the janitor said, hey, I know you. Come with me. I know where you got to go. Janitor takes him up to, you know, whatever floor of the hospital and, and shows him a room and says, hey, go in there. And he says, as I walked in, there was a woman laying in the hospital bed and her face lit up and she began to cry. And she said, I saw you on TV this morning. He had like one of those 30 second clips. That's all this. I mean, that, that's what they did. Like a, a thought of the day kind of thing. And he, she said, I saw you on TV this morning and I told God if he was real to have you come here and tell me. Pastor said, I didn't know if it was the Lord, but one of the things I've learned in my life, if it's the Lord, it makes me tired, <laughs> makes me uncomfortable, huh. and it's outside of my comfort zone. He wasn't saying, don't take a break. and rain. That's not what he, But when we're hearing something, and Matthew is demonstrating hospitality, some people, I mean, they, they are like the hospitality arms of Jesus. They just naturally flow in that way. And so folks that are like that, my counsel to them is because like this kind of thing, like the pandemic, is destroying people that way. Like it is a psychological crush for them not to have parties and Bible studies and prayer meetings and people over to the house. And If you've already got that gift, praise the Lord, ask him how to use it, and then ask the Lord, okay, Lord, I am probably grown comfortable to a certain extent with what do you want me to do about this? Okay. Application. You got that, Johnny? I got it. Okay. <laughs> then lastly, this is my last point of application here. And this one I, I put, uh, is last because it's part of this, well, I'm not comfortable with that. Matthew is a writer. He's a writer. His gospel is incredibly organized. Very, very powerfully thought through. One of the reasons that we can um, kind of hang our hats on the tradition that he wrote it in Hebrew, one of the things that kind of lends itself to that, as I mentioned, is grammar and that kind of stuff. Another one is layout. 
Matthew's 28 chapters, he didn't use chapters and verses, by the way, but his 28 chapters are organized around five major teachings and discourses from Jesus that are patterned after the first five books of the Bible, after the books of Moses. So he arranges the story of the gospel so that if you were Jewish and you had been sitting in the synagogue and learning to expect and to believe in the Messiah, the moment you heard Matthew's gospel read, it would resonate powerfully that in the beginning was the word. But Matthew does it in such a way that it's not like John where he just comes out with a baseball bat, you know, knocking a home run out and say, hey guys, pay attention. He organizes the literature, the thought itself around what God had already revealed to Moses. He's a writer. Some of you have gifts in writing. You're supposed to write. You're supposed to write poems. You're supposed to write short stories. You're supposed to write novels. You're supposed to write theological discourses. You say, well, I don't know how to do that. Well, I can guarantee you right now that if you don't, you won't. And that when you start, it's probably going to be bad. Because that's the nature of everything that we do. Most of us don't start out doing something really, really well. I mean, you've got to learn the skill. I mean, Wood Smith, isn't that right? Yeah. You've got to know where to cut that thing. Because you cut it the wrong way, that whole table's going. You've got to learn. that Everything that we do takes time to develop. That's, that's what makes virtue a virtue, right? A virtue is a virtue because it's something that becomes so innate and ingrained in who we are that it becomes part of who and what we are. So that's, that's what I want to make for our points of application. Have you heard the Lord call you? Are you following the Lord? And then the acts of hospitality and writing being two characteristics that are very much uh, Matthew, like what he does and how that becomes an example for us. And it could be, it could be that as we're looking over these 12 apostles, you're going to say, you know what, that guy Andrew, I really resonate with him. James, I, I really resonate with him. Matthew, I don't like him. <laughs> you, may, you may have that that thought, you know, that there are particular apostles that somehow, and that's kind of why we're, I want to do what we're doing with the 12. So that you get this injection on the inside that Jesus picks some very, very difficult people. Most of us don't want the headaches from difficult people. I mean, can you imagine, like, the jostling that goes back and forth amongst these guys? I wonder sometimes if Jesus didn't have to separate them. Like, Simon the Zealot, stand over there, keep your sword away from Matthew's hands. <laughs> like, I mean, you just kind of wonder about this stuff, because they are not serious. I mean, realistically, I mean, today, Jesus would go get, you know, a capitalist without restraint. He'd go get the, uh, somebody from the Taliban. He'd go get somebody from Liberation uh, Theology um, South America. He'd go get somebody that is, you know, um, you pick it. He goes and gets people who are diametrically opposed and says, y'all follow me. So the closer they get to him, the closer they got to get together, and the less they like each other. Arguing about who's the greatest. Can you see that now? Matthew's saying, well, you know what? I know these languages, and I can count, and I'm really good at this. What do you do, fish? <laughs> I mean, you know, think about that, right? So I hope that as, as we, we take the time to sit at the feet of the apostles, we can hear them tell us how the Lord took them from where they were and made them into these messengers of God incarnate. Because if he can do it with them, what you going to do with us? Amen. Amen. The collect, the prayer for Matthew is on page 632 in the prayer book. I invite you to just join along with me whether you have the words in front of you or not. His feast day is September 21st. 
Lord Jesus, you called Matthew from collecting taxes to become your apostle and evangelist. Grant us the grace to forsake all covetous desires and an inordinate love of riches, that we may follow you as he did and proclaim to the world around us the good news of your salvation. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.